All right, folks, this is Steve with Macro and Cheese. My guest is a returning guest, somebody who's very, very close to the issues in Gaza today. And it's with great pride and joy that I get to bring out his book as well. We talked about it before it was released. Now it has been released. And that is The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care by Dan Kavalik, the foreword by George Galloway. Dan's an author of critically acclaimed The Plot to Scapegoat Russia, The Plot to Attack Iran, The Plot to Control the World, The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela, and No More War, and has been a labor and human rights lawyer since graduating from Columbia Law in 1993. He has represented plaintiffs in the ATS cases arising from egregious human rights abuses in Columbia. And he's also taught international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law from 2012 to 2023. Bottom line is, is that Dan is an expert, has traveled around the world lecturing, and I'm really, really thrilled to have him back on the show, especially now that his book has finally been released. So with that, welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, let me just tell you, this has been one of the most challenging experiences to thread this needle that I've been trying to thread with class analysis, modern monetary theory, and geopolitical discussion points. And and this particular case for Palestine is an incredibly important one because what I feel like it does is I feel like it lifts the lid on empire, lifts the veil back. And it shows exactly how little agency we have within the electoral system itself, how very, very deaf, if you will, the uh, powers that be are. If, in fact, their goal is to even serve us in any way, shape or form, it feels like the APAC group has got absolute control of our government from every decision, every piece of propaganda that comes out, every news article that comes forth. The vast majority of the politicians that are, quote unquote, in office are going around basically calling Hamas the the terrorist organization and basically explaining away all the dead children, all the dead Palestinians, uh, the bombing of tent cities, you name it. It's almost like a uniform machine just coming out and just propagandizing the world that, hey, Israel's good. Doesn't matter that they're behaving as fascist. Doesn't matter that Netanyahu is a right wing ideological crazy man. Doesn't matter any of that stuff. It's like just pop up common nonstop propaganda flooding every mainstream outlet, every corporate stream outlet, every political stream outlet, save for, I hate to say it, but like X and YouTube and other places where You get to see, you know, TikTok for all of its faults that people whine about. I mean, we're we're seeing a genocide happen in real time, like never before. And and the kids aren't having it. The kids are sick of this political operation and and they're letting people know about it and they're getting beaten. We just had Bryce Green come on here recently and you had Aaron Good come on. But Bryce was arrested for being at these student encampments. I mean, this is serious stuff. And. There's an entire political class, an entire careerist group of people that will stay mum on this, will be quiet about it, will literally uh, defend genocide Joe Biden as he annihilates through funding the people of Gaza. Your book is very timely, and that was a lot of words right there, but I hope that it expresses exactly how I feel. I am beyond myself. I'm ashamed of what our country is doing. I'm ashamed, but I'm happy in ways that it shows, it reveals so much. Your thoughts, sir? Well, it does. And, you know, this is a podcast is ostensibly about my new book, The Case for Palestine. And I certainly hope people read it and won't go into more detail about it. I'd actually like to open my remark uh, discussing another book that I just finished. And that's Cormac McCarthy's book, Blood Meridian which is very timely and really could have been written about what's happening in Gaza right now. Um, if you're familiar with the book, it's a fictional book, but it's based on a you know, true story, for lack of a better term. It's based on these uh, American settler colonial scalp hunters in the American Southwest, where they went out and murdered Native Americans and scalped them 
and collected them and got bounties for them, um, both from U.S. And, and also Mexican leaders. And why is that relevant? Because what you're seeing in Gaza now, what you're seeing in Palestine, is nothing but settler colonialism of the type that the U.S. had, for example, in its early founding against the indigenous peoples, where we came in to a land that was already occupied and decided that while we could have tried to cohabitate with the people who lived here, that that was not the goal. The goal was, from the very beginning, to wipe out the indigenous population and take over everything, which we did from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And of course, in the case of Israel, what you have is the Israelis who came into a populated area with Palestinians, Arab peoples. There were some Jews at the time, but they were a very small percentage of the population when the Balfour Declaration was made in 1917. And that was a British declaration saying that uh, Jews should have a homeland in Palestine it made some reference to the rights of the Palestinians already living there, at least made a nod to them. But the goal was always to take over all of the land from the river to the sea, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. And that's always been the goal. And in 1948, the UN passed a resolution following up on the Balfour Declaration of 1917 to give Jews a homeland in Palestine. And of course, that was greatly motivated at the time by the Holocaust, which was obviously a terrible event, which affected a number of different groups, but obviously disproportionately Jews uh, who lost six million people in the Holocaust. So the world was very happy to give them a homeland. But again, the problem was that it was to give them a homeland in a place that was populated mostly by Arabs known as Palestinians. But even if you look at that UN resolution, it was only to give Jews a certain percentage of Palestine. And I'm forgetting what the, I talk about it in the book, what percentage it is, something around 50 some percent of Palestine. But of course, the settlers who were there, and they were there with the British, by the way, because by that time, the British had taken over from the Ottoman Empire. They decided to take more land than the UN even gave them. Because the goal, again, the goal was to totally eradicate that Arab population from Palestine. And so they carried out the Israeli settlers through these terrorist groups, really these militias, terrorist groups, led by various people, including Menachem Begin, who would become prime minister in the 70s and early 80s. They carried out the Nakba, which was this mass ethnic cleansing of about 750,000 Palestinians from their home and from their land. And there were massacres carried out in that process. And in fact, as I mentioned in the book, that was a very crucial part of the ethnic cleansing. They realized, and, and the main leader, Ben Gurion, his position was that the only way to really ethnically cleanse them was to terrorize the population. You had to put fear into them to get them to what they claimed back then, voluntarily move. Netanyahu uses those words, voluntary emigration. There's nothing voluntary about it. You go into, in the case of the Nakba in 1948, these armed gangs would go in and terrorize villages, destroy the villages, rape women. By the way, that's an, uh, an untold fact that most people don't know about, the rapes, massacre civilians, and drive the people out of those villages and, and overtake them. And that's what happened on a mass scale in around 1947 and 1948. You know how they talk about how the West was won in the United States. That's how the West was won, and that's how Israel was won. Very quickly, the UN became horrified about what they had wrought. And even countries that had supported the UN resolution to create the state of Israel, like most notably the Soviet Union, began to regret what they had done, and they quickly passed resolutions saying the Palestinians had right of return, and those resolutions of right of return have been reaffirmed over the years, but they've never returned. And um, again, just like the United States, where you still do have indigenous population, mostly living on reservations in horrible conditions with terrible uh, lifespans and health outcomes much worse than any other population in America, in Palestine, they didn't successfully ethnically cleanse everyone. They put them into what is known now as the West Bank in Gaza. 
and even after 1948, continued to gain more and more land from them, even within those areas. The big land grab happened in 1967 during what's known as the Six Days War. That's when they began their occupation of the West Bank in Gaza, which had at that point been controlled by Jordan and Egypt, respectively. Once they began occupying those areas, again, they began gobbling up more and more land to the point where now, and I have a map of this at the back of the book, where very little land now is left over for the Palestinians. And of course, now after this Gaza slaughter that started in October 8th of 2023, they'll even have much less land if they have any land at all in Gaza. And in the West Bank, Israel's also used the events of October 7 to start making more inroads even there. So the long and short of it is this is nothing but settler colonialism, where most of Europeans and Americans have come to the land of Palestine and forcibly and very violently taken over land. And just like the U.S. justified it on a strange religious notion of manifest destiny, that somehow God had anointed the white people of Europe to take over North America from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the Israelis have based their religious claim that somehow God gave them what is now known as Israel both of which being, in my own view, bad religion. You know, these are not based on, on anything, really. And now, you know, Israel really is an extension of the West, of the white West, and seen as this important beachhead of the West, particularly the United States, in the Middle East, which is otherwise, you know, an Arab world, from which the U.S. and other Western countries can project their power and gain access to the great resource of the Middle East known as oil. That essentially is, in brief, an explanation. So I'm looking at the map right now on the back of the book, and it starts off, you know, Israel's almost completely black. I mean, you know, meaning Palestinian run going back to 1947. And then I'm looking at the next iteration, the partition plan at 1947 splits it about 50, 50. I don't know if that's right, but right. Close enough. More or less. Yes. But then from 49 to 67, it looks like you're down to 25% Palestinian. And then over here in present, I mean, it looks like maybe 15%. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And and not even contiguous. The West Bank is all pockmarked with all these Israeli settlements. And for the most part, the Israelis have gotten the best land. And it tends to be on the top of these hills overlooking Palestinian villages and, and towns. And the Israelis allow their pollution and their industrial waste and their sewage to run down those hills into the Palestinian towns. And they have a series of walls and gates and highways that segregate the Israelis from the Palestinians. So again, even within the Palestinian territory, and again, those maps show that, the Palestinians don't have even contiguous control, you know, land. A big fight is over East Jerusalem, which under an international law is Palestinian. Israel has made it clear they want all of Jerusalem to be their capital, and they're taking actions to make that a reality. And the U.S. has been helping with that. Most notably, when Donald Trump moved in a very provocative act to the Arab, entire Arab world, moved the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv, which is the official capital of Israel, to Jerusalem. And a couple other states followed suit, including, um, I believe, Guatemala, and now I believe Argentina with this new leader. And again, despite the fact that the international law recognizes East Jerusalem as Palestinian and it is ostensibly supposed to be controlled by the Palestinian Authority, it's now being gobbled up by Israel, which is very – not only is it significant because it's taking more land from Palestinians, but this happens to be the most important historic land. This is really the Holy Land in East Jerusalem. This is where the old city is. This is where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is, which is the third most holy site in Islam. 
It's where some of the most important Christian sites are. It's where Jesus was crucified. It's where uh, his body was entombed in the Holy Church of the Sepulchre. Um, the tomb of the Virgin Mary is there. So you have these very important holy sites there. And that is where Israel's trying to take over. In fact, in the old city, they prohibit most Palestinians from even going inside it now. And again, the U.S. is complicit. And by the way, Biden became president. He did not countermand the decision to keep the U.S. embassy in Jerusalem. He upheld Trumpism. Yeah, let's keep it real. He is you know, blue and red MAGA, correct? Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, the the difference between the two parties on things like Israel, there, there's no daylight between them. This is a joint project of both parties. This is a very essential part of U.S. foreign policy. Very few presidents have tried to buck against that. There were a couple. Uh, I mentioned in the book Eisenhower did during the Suez crisis, got Israel to back off of Egypt and to relent from taking over the Suez Canal. John F. Kennedy, after Eisenhower, tried very hard to do a few things to reign in Israel. They, he tried to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. He tried to make APAC subject to FARA, the Foreign Agent Registration Act, which every other foreign agent that's engaged in political activity has to register under. He tried to do a few things, and um, that was greatly opposed. And of course, then he was assassinated. That was really the last time the U.S. in a major way made any efforts to rein in Israel. There were a couple smaller incidents where that happened. Interestingly, under Reagan, Reagan told Menachem Begin, who I've already mentioned, to relent from killing civilians in Lebanon, which he did just through a phone call. By the way, at that same time, Joe Biden was applauding the killing of civilians in Lebanon by Israel and said, hey, if we were in the same situation and Canada was attacking us, I'd be killing Canadian civilians. I and mean, even Begin was ashamed by that remark by Biden and had distanced himself from it, you know, which shows how deeply Biden is supportive of the Zionist Israeli project. Wow. Wow. Despite his crocodile tears from time to time about the deaths of civilians in Gaza, he is full on board in supporting this slaughter in Gaza. He has no interest in reigning in Israel, which gets us to Gaza. And I just want to Mentioned. So, you know, we mentioned the Nakba of 1947 and 1948, which displaced about 750,000 Palestinians, killed thousands of others. Gaza now is what many, even Israeli officials, are terming Nakba 2.0. And it actually is dwarfing the first Nakba, right? Because you now have about 1.9 million Palestinians that have been displaced within Gaza. That dwarfs the 750,000 of the first Nakba. And you now have the official figure being around 40,000 Palestinians killed, again, which dwarfs the number killed in the first Nakba. I think, by the way, that, and I mention in the book, and I talk about why I believe this, I, I believe that even that figure, the 40,000, is probably a huge underestimate because for several reasons. You have thousands of people still under rubble that aren't counted in that. And also, People are dying now of starvation, of disease in their own homes. Those people are probably not being counted because all of the figures that we're getting are relying on the Palestinian health ministry to tell us how many people are dying. And Israel's destroyed all the hospitals. And that's how deaths are counted, right? That's how births and deaths are counted, right? That you usually get your death certificate from a hospital. You get your birth certificate from a hospital. Well, the hospitals are for the most part gone. So who's counting the dead now? I mean, not many, you know, it's not being well counted. So I think you could easily double that 40,000 or triple it or quadruple it. I think when this is all done, it will be in the hundreds of thousands of people dead, which again makes the first Nakba much smaller in comparison. But this was always the goal. I mean, what Israel is doing in Gaza and also in the West Bank on a smaller scale, what they really wanted to do all along, and that is get rid of every Palestinian and not just get rid of them physically but destroy their heritage, destroy Jeez. any memory of them. And that's why also in Gaza, they've been, the Israelis have been methodically destroying churches, Christian churches and mosques. They destroyed the hall of record where all the records are kept. Birth certificates, again, death certificates. Um, they're trying to wipe out any memory that these people existed. And in fact, over the years have denied that a group called the Palestinians ever existed. They would like to wipe out the Palestinians from the map 
and pretend that they were never there to begin with. And again, that's always been the conceit and the myth of Israel. The myth has been a land without people for a people without land. But of course, there were people on that land. But we're to believe that's not true. And of course, the West has largely believed or given into that myth. This is the first time with the protests we're seeing that on a huge scale, Westerners are finally waking up and saying, oh, wow, there were people on that land. They've been horribly treated. They're being massacred now, and we don't accept it. And that gets back to my first remarks. I heard a very good um, interview, and I, I forget who it's with. I'm sorry I can't give an attribution for this statement, but I thought it was a very good statement of the problem Israel has with what they're doing right now. What he said is, Look, every Western country has had some form of settler colonial project. And again, the U.S., Canada are great examples of this, where they went in, they massacred on a huge scale, literally millions of Native Americans, spread disease to them, killed all the bison, which was their main source of food, and uh, took over the land. And he said, look, that was immoral even back when that was being done, but it was accepted amongst the Europeans that you could do that. What he said was, in the 21st century, that's not acceptable anymore. No one outside a very small group of people would actually acknowledge that that is a proper thing that you can do. So what the guy was saying is, well, Israel's essentially trying to do this about a century or so too late. This is not appropriate anymore. And then that's why you're seeing this reaction on the college campuses, because they know that these students, God bless them, understand you're not supposed to do that. We shouldn't have done it to begin with in North America. It was done. We need to deal with that. We need to maybe have reparations and other things, but it was done. But it can't be done anymore. And now we know, as you mentioned at the outset, we know that it's happening not because of the mainstream media, but because of social media. We're seeing videos and photos every hour of babies being killed in Gaza. And that's why, too, the entire Western narrative of its moral superiority and being the beacon of democracy, it's completely falling apart. And you can see that at these State Department press conferences where the spokespeople for the government, they can't even answer questions with a straight face. They look horribly embarrassed to try to defend the indefensible. And that's a problem. The U.S. has really never been in this position. I mean, even during terrible things the U.S. has done in Korea, Vietnam, Central America, they always found a way to have some at least colorable explanation for what they were doing that most people accepted, fighting communism or whatever. That's not working now. For the first time, there really is no ideological answer or moral answer for what's happening in Gaza. And so you see these officials being interrupted, being bothered on the street because they're in the wrong and they can't even tell people how they're not in the wrong. And I think that also explains why we're seeing really terrible violence against the student protesters and professors, by the way, who support them. Oh, my. Because the universities, which are supposed to be these institutions of learning and education, I thought, we all thought can't ideologically defend what's happening. So all they can do is billy club people. And the fact that that's the answer on a university campus at an Ivy League school like Columbia, for example, tells you everything you need to know, that this cannot be defended with words, with reasoning. And so they need to use violence. And it can't even be defended by the highest institutions of learning in the United States. That is creating a crisis. There is a crisis. I mean, what is going to happen? This is leading to revolutionary change, I believe, in the West. I hope so. The Palestinian uprising is radicalizing the West. It has held up a mirror to who we are. And it ain't pretty. It's never been pretty. Again, going back to our own settler colonialist history, slavery, other things, it's never been pretty. It's always been ugly. And now I really think for the first time in a profound way, people are seeing that ugliness for what it is and can't abide by it. You know, Dan, normally we talk about MMT here. And I have not been able to bring myself to just do a pure MMT show because as we're watching this happen, I know 
because I understand federal finance, I know that Joe Biden is literally not raising a nickel of taxes on a single soul, is using this to fund Halliburton and Boeing and Northrop Grumman and all these other uh, military industrial complex, you know, vipers, these parasites. And they are in turn handing weapons over. Israel couldn't do what it's doing if it didn't have the U.S. directly funding these things. And for as an MMT guy, focusing purely on the economy, I see this and I say, this is a perfect example of MMT. Look, you're watching public money go directly to the annihilation of a group of people that doesn't have a standing army, doesn't have major weapons growing or doesn't have any of the things it would need to defend itself. No air force, right, to defend itself, right. Not, and yet the greatest, the greatest, the largest, most violent empire in human history, the U.S., is sitting there literally full funding, like as if Israel is somehow or another this child, this little baby that needs protecting as, as this little teeny group of people trapped in a, basically a terrarium, it, it, you know, throw stones at them, et cetera. I mean, I think to myself, and I'll just throw this at you, okay? If I was a slave and I started talking to my other fellow slaves at night about let's break loose and the slave owner came to me and tried to stop me from doing what I was doing and we killed the slave owner, I am fully righteous in that killing. I have alleviated my oppressor. The idea that these people have the ability for a diplomatic solution I mean, they have offered to give back whatever hostages they had, prisoners, and Israel has rejected everything straight across the board. As we watch, they literally told folks to go to Rafah, it would be a safe place. And then subsequently, while they're trapped there, bomb the bejesus out of them. And you see the beheaded baby, real, literal, live, now dead, beheaded babies, burned up babies. And I see people genuinely either A, ignoring this and going about life and doing selfies and smiling on vacation and living la vida loco. Or I see them excommunicating people that actually speak up on it. Or worse, they're out there talking about Joe Biden sticking the landing or literally celebrating his State of the Union, things like that, instead of taking this opportunity to describe that public money can be used for good, which would be health care, ending student debt, fixing the climate, making reparations to descendants of slaves, whatever, or it can be used to fund genocide as it's happening right now. And I just, as an MMT person, I find it an opportunity lost. Either we're against genocide, and here's a great opportunity to explain the way federal finance works and what's going on, or we're silently complicit about genocide going about our lives. And so I just want to state unequivocally that we at Real progressives and macro and cheese are decidedly against genocide 100%, and we'll do whatever we can to expose that as often as we can. And I really appreciate you and your clarity of vision and your clarity of the message. There is no wiggle room here. This is a genocide. And if you look, there, there's not going to be anything left. There's not going to be a need for a two state solution. There's not going to be a need for uh, any kind of negotiation, they, they will be wiped out. They will be erased from history. Your thoughts? No, it's true. And what came to mind when you were saying, you're talking about the slave revolts and whatnot, there's this cognitive dissonance in U.S. culture where we, in the culture, we properly are trained to support David over Goliath, right? The I was thinking when you were mentioned the slave revolt, I was thinking of the movie Django Unchained which is a very popular Quentin Tarantino film, a remake of a, an older film by the same name, you know, where the, the protagonists were hunting down slave owners. And it was a very popular film. And of course, everyone properly rooted for the guys hunting down the slave owners. They weren't rooting for the slave owner. And we watch a movie like Star Wars, where the rebels fight against the horrible empire. And we know from George Lucas's notes that in fact, the empire was the United States. When he wrote it, he was thinking of the United States. And the rebels were Vietnam. He actually explicitly thought that when he was making the film. And we rooted for the rebels and we rooted against the empire, of course. 
But in real life, in real life, many people continue to root for Goliath over David. Now, some of that is, though, because of propaganda, because they're turned around, because they don't really understand who the David and Goliath are in the story. And of course, in the case of Israel, Palestine, they're very confused because Israel happens to have the Star of David on their flag. They wrap themselves in the mantle of David. But that doesn't make them David in the circumstance. But people are confused. Finally, that confusion is starting to break apart. And again, it is because of social media, which has been the best friend the Palestinians have ever had, because for the first time in a long time, we are seeing the reality of these types of wars that the U.S. is supporting. Really, the last time before this that we saw that was in Vietnam, when that mainstream press actually did some reporting. You know, 60 Minutes went there and showed soldiers calmly setting huts on fire and old women outside crying and sobbing. And that made an impact on people. But since Vietnam, journalism has collapsed. Mainstream journalism is a joke, and it doesn't cover wars like that anymore. We don't see dying in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. We don't see anything about it. I mean, we had this war in Afghanistan for 20 years. I remember very few segments about Afghanistan in the news. It was happening, but no one really paid attention to it. But now, again, with social media, people are seeing these terrible atrocities. And it's very clear who David is in his story. The American people, for all their faults, have decent instincts, and their instincts is to side with the poor over the rich and whatnot. Our goal, people like you and me, is to spread the word about the true nature of these wars and who the players are and who David is and who Goliath is. And again, the mouthpieces of the government are unable to compete with the reality that we're seeing. And that's why they want to censor people. That's why they want to get rid of professors who support Palestine. That's the main reason they want to get rid of TikTok. And APAC's been pushing. They don't like these little videos of kids being killed in Gaza. And they try to portray that as propaganda, but that's the, it's the opposite of propaganda. It's real. And when humans see other humans being treated that way, they recoil. And that's what you're seeing on the college campuses, you know? And uh, I only hope that it spreads. We need a bigger peace movement because more war is coming. And we didn't even get to other conflicts, but this government wants more war. It wants more direct war with Russia, maybe with China. And we need to stop that. And we're the only people who can, you know, and we we're privileged to live in this country that wants these wars because maybe we can stop it. Right. You know, I look at folks, I, I want to give a shout out to a few people that I've been following closely that are not necessarily, that don't get enough credit. You know, obviously the gray zone with Aaron Mate and Max Blumenthal, too. Yep. Exactly. Max as well. But then you look over at people that maybe go under the radar, folks that were once centrist shit lib uh, advocates like Peter Dow has been unapologetically front line on this. Uh, you know, Eco Marxi, a.k.a. Tiberius on X, has been remarkably relentless in his attacks on the genocide. Um, there has been folks like Ben Norton who has been relentless on these things as well. I, you know, yourself on and on and on. I mean, seeing someone in particular like Kate Willett, who is a comedian, but she's also an unapologetic Democrat. And she's out there leading front line, like just to show that this is not about politics. This is about genocide, right? And she's out there literally saying, oh my God, I cannot believe the level of depravity that people are deploying to bully people around to overlook genocide, to not look, do not look here. Yeah. She's quite frankly, she's like, I'll do whatever it takes. And this peer thing, oh my God, more aid was getting to the folks in Gaza before the freaking fraudulent PR stunt called a peer was put out there and has done nothing but create problems. And now it's floating away. Yes, I, I just want to say. I mean, we couldn't even do it in $50 million. It's a joke. Think about this. The Democrats were traditionally the party of labor. That's been a long time since that's been true. Yes, and civil rights. Yes. And on and on and on. But we're trading off of the memories of these things. Now, I am. Let me just state for anybody that's wondering, I'm not focused on electoral politics in any way, shape, or form. But the narratives that we have to fight through to get people determined to fight against genocide. Folks, G 
genocide, like, you know, the never again of 8 million Jews being killed in Auschwitz. The never again is happening again right now. This is not political. If this is political to you, that's disgusting to me. This is 100% simply about slaughtering people indiscriminately. I mean, we're talking about AI drones literally killing people. We're talking about technology from the United States being used to slaughter children in our name, not in our tax dollars, in our name. And in reality, we don't have nearly enough. I mean, think about what kind of look and feel the aesthetic of all these protesters across. I mean, I see the stuff Jordan Sheraton shows us, all the marches and, and the protests and the violent beatdowns that are occurring in New York. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. You know, Columbia, you name it. I mean, literally, I've, Jill Stein got hit with a bicycle. I mean, gee, unbelievable. I mean, like, I don't care what you think about any of the individuals. I don't care if you even like Muslim faith. I don't care if you have issues of patriarchy. There are legitimate issues that we could talk about after we've stopped the genocide. But a genocide, no matter who they are, I mean, I, I have a hard time watching people talk about the United States and these colors don't run and I'm proud to be an American as we're watching the indigenous people in this country have all the ailments that you laid out in the beginning here. I'm so disgusted with this kind of privileged perspective <laughs> and I don't even know how to function in that. Like I go to bed at night feeling sick inside that there's not more we can do. People run around with the I just voted sticker on their forehead as if they've done something but in reality, you should already know, inherently know, there has been study after study after study after study after more studies that show we live in an oligarchy. We do not live in a democracy. We don't even really live in a constitutional republic, quite frankly. We live in the American exception, as Aaron Good would say, that the rest of the world has to follow these rules or be worried about bombs from the U.S. But the U.S. doesn't have to follow these rules. I mean, think about this. Brave groups of people, South Africa, I think Turkey. Who all was it that stood up and brought a case? Nicaragua. Nicaragua, yeah. yep. Brought a case to jail Netanyahu for war crimes. What was the U.S.'s response? You do that, we'll invade the Hague. We'll take, we'll do some. I mean, what the hell, man? This is ridiculous. It, on its face, it should be like, oh, wow, we're doing that. Why do you think that we're not seeing the lights go on for these folks. I mean, are they that propagandized? Are they that mesmerized by the belief of American exceptionalism? It's just unbelievable. I think some are. I think many who are only watching the mainstream news are not really keyed into what's truly happening. And that's a lot of people. I think many Democrats are willing to look the other way because it's Joe Biden's war. And they are so afraid of, you know, prospect of Donald Trump that they are willing to hold their nose and, and vote for Biden and don't want to criticize him. I think that answers a lot of it. I think that's a lot of the reason. And that's why, truthfully, having a Democrat in office, you know, again, in reality, can be worse than having a Republican because the, the people who would naturally protest war who are the liberals, look the other way when it's their president that's doing it. Obama got away with murder, literally. Clinton did, and now Biden is. And if this were Trump's war, you'd see maybe a lot more protest out there because, again, the people naturally inclined to protest over these things will be protesting them. That's why, you know, the, in part, there were huge, much bigger protests in truth in the run up to the Iraq war. And that's because it was George W. Bush, because people hated him. And, you know, I'm okay with people hating him. But the point is, if something's wrong under a Republican, it's also wrong under a Democrat. That should be an obvious fact for people. But in this two-party system we live in, it's not. That is not a reality. The reality is they root for their own team, such as it is. Even their team does nothing for them. I mean, what have the Democrats done, even on the other issues people care about? Have they defended abortion rights? No. Absolutely. Biden had a uh, Democratic majority. In both houses, they could have passed legislation to protect abortion. Did they do it? No. What are they really doing, even on the social issues people care about? Nothing. I mean, 
What are they getting from Biden? Nothing. I mean, it really is more matter of style more than anything. You know, I, I joked, I think, uh, you know, the difference between Obama and Trump was the difference between uh, Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy. Uh, one was kind of a handsome guy and the other guy was uh, unkempt to clown, but they both killed people. So who, what's the difference? But apparently those appearances matter to people. I mean, you know, which is sad. But again, on the bright side is you do have significant protests happening. What are they accomplishing? I mean this with like they're not stopping the genocide, but maybe what we're seeing is an American public unifying around a set of principles. And maybe that does change us for the better long term. I don't know. It hasn't stopped the genocide. That's true. In truth, it hasn't even slowed it down or even sped up humanitarian aid. I mean, those are realities we have to confront. At the same time, it has forced the administration to try to answer some of these things, which is good, the fact that they are being held at least somewhat accountable for what's happening. But yeah, I think this is probably the demonstrations are more important on the medium to long term. I think it will change the trajectory of this country and Israel's too. What do you think about the latest changes to the way that they're pushing up, you know, anybody that speaks ill on this, that talks about genocide will be considered a terrorist sympathizer or a terrorist. And anti-Semitic. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about that because for real, these are the things that terrify us. We feel like our job is to inform people. I'm not a voter. I'm not telling people who to vote for. I'm saying I'm standing on principle and I'm saying, for God's sake, people are dying now, not in a month, not in six months right here, right now. What are we doing about it? We're accepting this. And to me, the idea of turning it into politics is where I depart. I can't handle that. I, I don't want to hear any rah-rah. I don't want to hear about your candidate. I don't want to hear about your, I don't want to hear about any of that. I, I, I want to see us not do these things that are truly, if you want to quote Hillary, deplorable. I mean, this is as deplorable as it gets, is it not? I mean, is there, what is the other thing that we could do beyond genocide that's worse? I am trying to find it. No, this is as bad as it can get. I mean, that's why this idea, oh, we're afraid Trump's going to get elected. It's like, how worse can it be? I mean, Biden is doing the worst. Don't worry about who's going to be president in January. Worry about the guy who's there now. That should be the focus is stopping this genocide. I think those memes that say, if you wondered what you would do as a German during the Holocaust, you know now yep. because you're doing it. If you're not protesting this genocide, you are a good German. That's terrifying. That's just the fact. Yep. This is a moral litmus test for people. And many people are failing it. Some people are not. I applaud those people. I applaud people who are brave enough to stand up, as you say, against now new laws that are trying to outlaw speech. And that's what those laws are, again, because the powers that be can't defend what they're doing. So they just want to quiet everyone who's criticizing it. But, you know, the good news is the people who are protesting are just ignoring that. It's, it's just background noise. And the claim of anti-Semitism, which is so overused, I mean, it's a shame because there is real anti-Semitism and that should be condemned. But this thing where anytime you criticize Israel for murdering people, you're anti-Semitic, which is absurd. Yes. But that is the charge. People aren't taking that seriously anymore. It doesn't have the power it used to have. And you have plenty of Jews and even Holocaust survivors who are saying, no, you're wrong. It's not anti-Semitic. It's human. And if you oppose the Holocaust, you have to oppose this. And you can't hide behind the Holocaust to commit another genocide, right? I mean, that just stands to reason. And Israel's been very adept at using false claims of anti-Semitism, of misusing the Holocaust to defend its actions. But again, that is starting to slip away, that those defenses are starting to slip away. People are not taking those as seriously as they used to. And that's a good thing. I hope that in the medium to long term, what's happening now, the protests are going to have an impact on that discourse. And it's a critical thing because this country needs some self-analysis, needs full-throated discussion about who we are, where we've come from, and where we're going as a nation. 
Amen, brother. We have to have that come to Jesus moment that we've never really had. And this is going to help do that. I hope so, sir. I really do. Dan, do me a favor. Plug your book one more time before we get out of here. Yeah. First of all, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed the discussion. The new book is The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters, Why You Should Care. You can get it on Amazon at the bookstore near you. If they don't have it, they can order it for you. Uh, you can also get it directly from my publisher, skyhorsepublishing.com. Thank you so much, Dan. My name's Steve Grumbine. I'm the host of Macro and Cheese with my guest, Dan Kavalik, for the organization and for the people of Gaza. We are praying for you. And without further ado, we bid you adieu, and we are out of here.